Okay, so uh, we started streaming on YouTube. Okay, let me know when to start with that. Okay, one minute probably is gonna be five by seven. I have my coffee, my coffee, I'm ready. Okay. Good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Andrew with us today. And uh, for sure, we'll have some questions for uh, Dr. Andrew. And Dr. Omid, as he mentioned, he will go through the installation of the MMCTV and answering uh, some of the questions. Uh, Dr. Omid, the floor is yours. Okay. So I'm just writing down. I do actually have two. Uh, well, I have a cluster, a Raspberry cluster, uh, and that's the IP. And then I have an Ubuntu virtual machine. Uh, so I need to get the IP because we will need this information to configure, I think, the, the, to the configuration. So I've opened, uh, I went to MMCTP GitHub. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to demonstrate is how we can install this on a Windows machine. So I have EGS uh, configured on the Raspbian as well as on Ubuntu. And I have the Beam model, it's a variant true Beam model. Uh, text files, everything is set there. Uh, so I will start by going to the, I'm just following the instructions, okay? <laughs> because I think if I can do it, anyone can do it. So uh, documentation, uh, okay. Where do I go, Andrew, from here? Is there an installation section? Yeah, there's a, under the the wiki, there should be, okay. you can hit the documentation there, yeah. Okay, that thing. so there, there it is, we have Windows OS installed. Yeah. Okay, so execute and manual install, okay. Builds for Windows, I'm gonna get, download this. This is the latest one, so 64 bit, that's fine. OK, 
Is it downloading? Uh, I think it's reading still okay. uh, loading from the system. Okay, there it is here. And we need to also uh, download this configuration file. How about this P-Link and PSCP EXEs? Where do I get these from? Or they are part of? So you should be able to find them uh, on the internet. Okay. Because I those are applications written by other people, I didn't bundle them within okay. GitHub. Yeah, but um, maybe you could you could add the link. You know, it's, it's oh, that's a good idea. Them. Yeah. Yeah. So link link them uh, so it's easier. Okay, now so it's p link, right? Yeah. You got exe download. That would be get me there. Or that's putty, but that's not what we want, I guess. Or should I just type p-link? Is it this one, Andrew? I think so. I It's been so long since I've downloaded them. I, I can send you the- Okay, p-link. Okay, I thought it's this. Small. Open source. So do you think this is what, what I should get? This is from... Uh... That looks appropriate. Okay, stable download, and you go over here, please, stable download. Well, actually, no, wait a minute. This doesn't look okay. like it's the right program. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll send you the link, Lamid, and... Yes, send it, please. What I'll do is I'll upload the more official link for those applications. But just to speed things up, I'll send you a link for these files right away so that we so that there's not... Uh, You'll put them to chat? chat or, I'll, I'll just email them to you. So I guess you, with, if you're doing Mac or Linux, you don't need actually these files. Uh, no, they're built into the operating system. Okay. They, they're not necessary, but for Windows, we need them for the communication between your cluster and your Windows machine. So I've sent you an email with my copies of those small applications. Okay. 
And what I can do is up, update the GitHub so that the user can go directly to the source of these applications. They, they are fairly old applications, um, but I'm, I'm quite confident I could find the uh, appropriate host that's still supplying these applications. Okay, so I'm uh, sharing it with me on uh, Google Drive. I'll just download uh, uh, the files. And, So this is the P-Link, I have it, P-Link 5. There are three files that then they suddenly disappeared and from the shared folder. So there is the, this, I need this file. Did you, were you able to acquire all the files? Uh, well, th there are three, right? So yes. Three, okay, but yeah. for some reason, it's, uh, okay, I have this one. Okay. Oh, no, we can always uh, download from, uh, I can download from Google. Okay, I will go back. Let me just drag the file and put it. They here. still appear to be on the shared drive, so I don't. Not sure. So I have both files, the uh, P-Link and the uh, PSP, PSCP. Putty, we can always download from the net. So that's a very popular application uh, for telnetting. Do, do you really need it? Uh, Are you asking about Putty? 
Yes. No, uh, putty is only useful if you're manually uh, yeah. picking up on okay. the calculations. But send SSH, SSH client. For yes. Windows. Yeah. Although now with Windows 10, I think there is they made something built in uh, part of Windows. Okay. Uh, uh, can you see now the screen? Yeah. Okay. So I have, uh, so the configuration file is downloaded, Windows uh, zip file and plink PC, PSCP are all installed. So move the MMCTP executable and configuration folders within. Okay, so we need to make that folder, I guess. That's correct, yeah. Uh, okay, so. And. Uh... Where is program files in Windows? <laughs> the, you should you C drive on it. Okay. Go to C drive and then you will find the program files. Okay, because this is my uh, file. Okay, I have no, the C drive. Go to the C drive. Okay, double click here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now program then, files. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I need to make these two folders. I'll make a McGill medical physics folder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just copy paste to me the folder name and then you can you can, can I copy from here like this? No, no, no. Just okay. McGill. McGill Medical Physics. Yeah, this one. And then inside it make a new folder. Exactly. And then MMCTP exactly. I need to make this folder. Andrew, for Windows, uh, there used to be an installer, right? That's correct. Yeah, I used to have an installer for both Windows and Mac. Okay. And it's uh, quite a bit of work to keep that updated. So I've stopped compiling a, an installer application. The next, uh, uh, I need to move those two to the C drive, not to the folders. Well, first you'll want to move the executable and the configurations folder okay. into that MMCTP folder. So that is in download. So if I do this, let's uh, open or show a folder. These are zip files. I, I keep them. You, like need you need to extract. Do you need to extract them? Yeah. yeah. OK, so right click. No, no, just double click on it. It opens directly because this is a zip file. Windows is able to open a zip file without an extraction. Double click on it. Yeah, file exit. Uh, this is the first two. Okay. There. Okay. So this is the, the executable. So I just need to, uh, okay. So I copy these now into that folder. Yes. So MMCTP, continue. Uh, just take, uh, do it for all the current, yes. Okay, now the, now the configuration. So this is the folder I can, Copy it like this, I guess. Uh, can, you open the, can you open the configuration folder? Uh, Dr. Andrew, this should be in the uh, MMCTV directly or under configuration? This is perfect. Yeah, and it okay. needs to have its own folder. Yeah. Okay. It's like the Mac. Mac is like this. <clears throat> okay. So now this is the second step. The uh, Let's go back. Okay, and that's it, I guess. So you also have to move plink and. Okay, but the, where do they go to the C folder, the C drive? They go to the, they go to the C folder. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I go back and these two. And it is possible with Windows 10 that these applications become redundant, but I haven't explored that. 
if I double click, it should execute or give me a warning that it's not compatible. Should I check that? Uh, you can, it, it'll flash something and disappear probably. Okay. So no warning messages, that means that they're, they're okay. Yeah, well, this should be fine. I use Windows 10 with them. So I think they're <laughs> fine on Windows 10. Okay. So to make things nice, so how do I, okay. Let's make you wanna make shortcut. a shortcut? Yeah. Yeah, right so click. Here, create shortcut. Okay. So we have a shortcut on the desktop, okay? So I guess the installation now finished. <laughs> installation is done now. Yeah, done. Okay. Uh, just for information, I have a DICOM folder here uh, where I have DICOM files that we're going to test uh, once the, the we configure. Uh, I mean, just to make sure that it's right. So I have the DICOM files here. Okay, should I start launch it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can I ask you if you trust this application? Yeah, I don't run, but what, where do I say? Or info, I maybe? Okay, run anyway, yeah, okay. So this is the first thing you will see when you start it is you have to accept the license uh, terms and conditions. Uh, but it, I don't think it will appear again. Okay, so now this is running, or at least, you know, installation is finished. So the, the first thing I would do, Amid, is figure out where there's some preference folder configurations to do. This is usually what I do also. I will yeah. go to the configuration and the system admin settings. And there I have folder location preferences, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, let's change it. I'm gonna put it, uh, I'm gonna put it in the desktop or in the documents folder. So I'm gonna, this can you see, okay. Do you recommend, I like to separate them. I like to make subfolders. Would you recommend? I would, I would have individual folders for, okay. for different aspects. Okay, then yeah. I'll probably uh, need to so I'll change this. And then can I create a folder from here? New folder, yes. And this is going to be Magil. Okay. So I think you have, if you want to create oh, yeah, a new, yeah. sorry, yeah, here. Yeah. That's okay, where you that's, would take it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a Windows user, so, <laughs> so uh, that's. And I, uh, uh, that is our wizard actually. In the, uh, what I would recommend, Wamid, is yeah. and all users is to avoid spaces as much as possible in folder names. Okay. Most of the time, I'd say it's handled appropriately, but we do use some Linux commands okay. uh, uh, with um, PuTTY and, and PLINK. And every now and then it, it could cause an issue. Okay, here I'll put the icon. Okay, r 2 I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm that. I don't need those commissioning, probably not. The rest I'm not gonna put down. These yeah, that's probably, fine. Yeah, those are the three the, basic ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is going to be McGill. Okay, that is fine. And then the beam and RC. Uh, that's going to be uh, this one. And uh, the last one, icon folder. Okay. Okay. Should I move now my icon files there? So I'm planning, what my plan is to do is, okay, I have um, the documents, DICOM. So these are DICOM files that I have exported from a treatment planning system. And I'm just gonna put them under the DICOM folder that, uh, that was set in the preferences. Because whenever uh, you want to import DICOM uh, RT, the system is going to look into that folder, the one we have set in the preferences. Yes. 
It, it will, but the yeah. you can I, change it. I know. Yeah, you I, can change it. Yeah. For each application, each time you import, yeah. you can change it. So that's so now the, if I hit hit on import, <coughs> it should read now the files in that folder, and it will populate the patients and. Okay, so what's the next step, uh, Andrew? What do you recommend now? Well, what I would do is configure your shell connections. Yes, okay. So we go here, the configuration and remote shell connections. So we go to shell login. <clears throat> okay, so I have two shells, both are Linux. So the first one was uh, 192, 168, 8, 11. Uh, sorry, uh, well, I can call this RAS. Okay. And machine is 198, 192, 168, 11, uh, 9.11. So it's a Linux, uh, the user over there is I called it, um, I created an MMCTP user. And uh, I'm gonna put my secret password there. This is online. And uh, here the line uh, feed prompt, I'm gonna also put MMCTP. So I showed last time how do you actually set the line prompt uh, for, for uh, in, in Linux. That is uh, something you will add to the dot bash RC is PS1 equals to, and then there is a command. I can show you uh, this again. So I'm gonna test the connection. <clears throat> Let's keep our, okay. So connection is okay. Oh, so indeed. Yes. Uh, it says connection okay, but if you go and look at your shell run options and your shell refresh, you can see what it did. If you had a problem, you might be able to debug based on the information here. So I, I, I don't see a problem. Just no, I don't see a problem either. It, it, it worked it. fine. Yeah. 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 But uh, so here connection, okay. And then I will also change. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is secure copy, right? Yes. Yeah. Because that's what I use. Yes. Okay. So things are okay. Then the batch of the queuing system uh, that is installed there is there. And uh, the number of queues, I have only one queue, which is called long. Okay. And I think this is very important. This is where you have to define where is uh, the folder for uh, EGS and RC. In my case, it's under home dash MMCTP. So why am I getting this? Uh, You're getting an interesting character on your keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. MMCTP. EGS underscore home. And I think for most of us, this is probably the folder. It's under EGS home, but uh, this user is going to be different. Anything else? I think that's okay. good for now. Okay. I have a question. Now, uh, uh, Slurm is, you know, it's a queuing system. It's not just a pattern for 5%, for but it queues things. I have 68 uh, cores. Okay. Okay. The maximum number of running jobs, this is what I find sometimes puzzling and I don't quite get it. So what's the number I should put here? Should I put 68 or should I put, for example, 1000 because I can queue? Uh, I would put 68. Okay. Well, actually, because it can queue, you can put any number you want. That is the reason that text box is there is for the at system, yes. which doesn't queue. So then you really want to limit MMCTP from dumping more jobs into the queuing system. But if your system can queue, then because you can- this is what I found when I put the number uh, to equal to the number of cores on Slayer. I can submit a beam. When I want to submit another beam, it's not going to submit it. Exactly. So yeah. I would 
increase that number. So that's about 2,000. Okay. Okay, so this is one queue I have. And uh, then I'm going to actually make another one because I have a virtual machine. Uh, let me just make sure that it is running. And I need to get the IP address. Okay, so this is now my uh, 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 Ubuntu virtual machine. So think of this as a dedicated computer. <laughs> and to get the IP, uh, okay, command is IP under uh, space ADDR. So it will show you the IPs for the networks you have available. So 127.0.0.1, this is a local. So we were not interested in this one. But this one is the interesting one. So that is my IP on, on my, uh, for the virtual machine, 10.211.555.105. Uh, so let's copy that. While I'm here, I can actually show you the setting for the bash RC. Okay, so it's this is this line. We need to add this line into the five dot bash RC, and this line will define how the prompt will look looks like. So now it, it will, uh, the prompt will have, you know, the user MMCTP with the dollar sign, and uh, uh, MMCTP looks for that uh, text to know that, okay, it can execute or the shell is ready to, to receive a command and so on. Okay, so let's go back. That's correct, Andrew, right? If there is something wrong, just tell me, look, I'm, I'm completely wrong. No, that, that's correct. Yeah, okay. And because I am not a skilled programmer, okay. this is the method how I've determined that the shell is ready for a new command. There could be more elegant ways of programming the interlink between your remote connection and MMCTP. But in its current fashion, this is, this is what MMCTP is looking for. So let me put, this is the IP for uh, uh, the shell, I forgot the IP. So uh, 55.105. So many of you probably have uh, installed uh, Ubuntu virtual machine. You just need to go there and uh, install and get the IP. I'm pretty sure. So I'll put all this Ubuntu. Okay. The user, again, I use the same user, but you could have defined a different user. It, it does not matter. Okay. And uh, uh, again, this. Okay, let's test the connection. Connection not okay. So we we'll go and see uh, here. Log. Let's try it again. Connection is not okay. Could not agree. Okay. Could not agree. A key exchange algorithm available. Do you have an idea what's the problem, Andrew? Uh, Andrew? I, what I would do there, Wamid, is I would open up a uh, putty or something and try and do that manually, try and do that SSH connection for that cluster, because there might be something, there might be a setting on that cluster that uh, is preventing an SSH connection. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a new uh, connection, by the way. So probably it needs to get the key and, and so on. Yeah. Okay, so let's download putty.
Okay, so let's try it from here. Dot uh, two one one. Dot uh, one fifty five. Dot twenty five. And uh, let's try it again. Yes, I think this is the issue. So it needs to grab to make a, a key. Yes, login as uh, so we'll try MMCTP. There it is. So it works. So I guess now it, it probably is going to work. So let's test the connection again. Not okay. I still have the same issue, Andrew. I don't know why. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, uh, you know, I'm just going to, uh, because I wanted to show that you can actually have multiple shells. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, uh, when you launch a simulation, you can decide to which shell to submit. Or you can let uh, uh, MNCTP to manage that. So I was hoping to get two shells running. But if I have one running, then uh, probably just due to the time, I'm going to proceed. But I will look into this, this issue. Because most of us have actually virtual machines, and I hope they will not face that problem. Now, we'll, we'll, what, we'll, what I can do next, Wameed, is we could look into exactly what's going on there with the shell return. It, what it should do is it should hit yes to accept the key certificate. It may not be able to do that process with that current install for okay. some reason. So okay, we'd so have just... to debug the return that's coming back. Uh, we can do that together later. Yes, because it works on on Putty. I can block. Yeah. But I, uh, this is the. By the the shell. Did that, which shell? Uh, I think it's SSH. If I'm not mistaken, let's try it again. Just so that. I'm sure. Yeah, it's port twenty two SSH. Okay, we'll try just one more time. But I think it works from Putty. It does not work from uh, MMC. Yeah, that's that appears to be correct. Yeah, I can log in. Okay, so I'll proceed. I will go to you know to the next uh, step. Uh, here. But at least we have now one shell. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Okay. So what's next then? So we have the shells. We have the preferences, the folder preferences. Yes. So the next step I would do is I would import a patient okay. that has a Linux and MLCs yes. uh, that are typical to what you're going to be using on because okay. there's other configurations that MMCDP will initialize based on this DICOM import. So we'll go to import. And that's why I, I actually uh, brought the DICOM files because I think it's easier to import and let MMCTP handle the, the beam the, <laughs> rather than defining one yourself, exactly. especially because of the ML, uh, MLC, uh, for the MLCs. So we'll do that. So currently I don't have any Linux defined on the application. Okay, so we'll do this one, do the VMAX plan actually. So let's transfer that.
And when the patient is uh, imported and converted to a uh, format or McGill RT, it's going to be stored under the McGill RT folder. And I'm going to open that to show because then you can go if you want to delete the patient. Maybe you want you can delete from that folder, or maybe there is an e uh, I mean, a user interface to delete to remove patient. But let's uh, get this finished. And just for your information, I, I've already modified uh, those X, Y, Z, the macro, because if you're doing CT uh, images, uh, you need to change the number of voxels uh, for those X, Y, Z user code. And that is, uh, uh, is uh, let's just share. So uh, if I go to the those XYZ folder, and then uh, there is this file, user macros. So if when you open it, and uh, you go down, so these are variables that are important, uh, setting the uh, voxels uh, here, for example, the IMAX, JMAX, KMAX, and that is actually documented. So here I did not do it in the Ubuntu installation, you can do it now, but on the Raspbian, it's done. So here, based on address recommendation, well, this has to be uh, 512 and, uh, for the Z-512. This would depend on the number of uh, slices that you typically, you know, patient would have in your clinic. Uh, in the past, I think 120 was sufficient, but nowadays we go, in our clinic, at least we're going with three millimeter resolution. So I need to increase uh, this. I found 190 is is probably better. Yeah. Let me change the last one to 512. It's 5 to 1. Uh, yeah, okay, 5 to 1. So this will represent the no X boxes. And this is, uh, so this is from left to right. And this is from and to post. And the J is from soup to inf. That's typically the number of slices. So once you've done that, you save and uh, we type make clean so that it removes any comp compilation of those X, Y, Z. And then we type make again, it should compile it with, with uh, uh, you know, with these settings. If you, you run uh, MMCTP with uh, those X, Y, Z, I mean, uh, DICOM CT file, and you have not done this step, step you will get a segmentation fault as an error. So this is going to compile. We can go back to the uh, share screen. We can go back to no, it's not this one. You know what, instead of going back and forth, I'm just gonna share my full screen. That's easy. <laughs> okay, so this one, you can take it out. This, okay. this is now a special machine. So these are the number of slices. 120 will not work because I think for this patient, it was 189. One of the things about that, Wameed, is you can change where you're calculating over the region of interest. So you may not want to calculate over the whole data set, and you can narrow it into the area of concern. Okay, that's with the MMCTP? Yes, yeah. Oh, I did not know that feature. I'll show you uh, once we yeah. get to that point of yeah. 
hopefully we get to that point of running a uh, patient calculation and where the user can select the borders for the supinant direction. So I'm running on a virtual machine. That's why things are a bit slow on uh, uh, my computer. Any questions uh, from uh, from anyone while this is uh, finishing? Just grab the mic and. Uh... Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is the actual problem if we leave the the prompt as dollar itself without putting any other things. I tried with both actually. I tried with the name and also tried with the only simple dollar sign. In both way it connected. So what could be the problem I can face if we don't if we leave it as the dollar only? So I'll answer that one. It really will depend on how many times that dollar sign will come up in other messages. Let's say the dollar sign is used in some of the output from an EGS calculation. It could be a beam calculation or dose XYZ calculation. If that symbol appears in any of the output text, MMCTP will assume that the command has finished and will, will execute the next command in line. So it has a batch of commands to send and it does one after another when it sees the line feed prompt has been returned. So it could be that you run into no issues until you run some very specific situation where that dollar sign is output by the program that you're running. And then you'll run into problems at that point. Yeah, thank you, I understood now. Okay, so I think the import uh, finished. The graphical user interface somehow got we need to lock this, Andrew, we need to lock it, or at least it scales properly. Okay, so this is the patient. And uh, just to show you where is that store. Okay, so if I go to documents, uh, so DICOM, that's where the original DICOM files were located. Now, McGill MMRT, you see there is the patient after conversion from MMRT, uh, from DICOM to uh, McGill RT format, the patient is here. Of course, this is an anonymized patient, so I can go and change the name uh, uh, later on. So it, it is located in that folder. folder. Okay. So file. Okay, so now when you open MMCTP again, you should find a pa that patient or a patient. I think uh, there is a way to change. Uh, it's stuck now, it's not, it doesn't, or is it doing something? Okay. What are you trying to do, Amit? Are you trying to open? No, I'm trying to rename. So just to show people if, if you want to rename. I, I remember I saw it somewhere. There is a rename option. It's it's yeah. with it's within the you have to open the patient first though. Okay. So here so we're gonna open the patient. So you'll have to click on the CT first. CT. Yeah, so we expand and then we select the CT and then open. Okay, so now you can see that the, the CT images and the contours are appearing. 
here is the plan and, uh, and uh, the plans, uh, the, the beams are listed here, down here. So there are two imaging, uh, this we can delete, remove three imaging, and but the, these two are the, the treatment uh, fields they actually are. And uh, once the patient's loading, it's from here. Patient information, there is where you can uh, modify. So I can call this my first demo patient. Okay. Uh, I would, I would, I would avoid spaces. Okay. Fine. That's okay. This is this is our next step. Okay. So the error message that appeared, something else. Maybe did not like rename my. Uh, let's let's do it. But the patient is loaded. So the beams, the, the beam model is not yet defined. Okay. So uh, let me open again, and uh, there will be an error message that will pop up. That okay. I don't know how to calculate those uh, fields, uh, which beam they belong to and so on. And that would be our next step is to define uh, uh, the beams. So you notice the, the error messages when it was renaming. The renaming of a patient is quite uh, destructive to the program because the, it uh, just the way it was programmed, it has to rename folders and files. So it, it, it is problematic and I wasn't too surprised when it threw up a bunch of errors. Probably the name is gonna be okay. It did not probably, but the uh, uh, MRN uh, or the ID, that's might be the issue. But anyway, I'm just gonna wait for the error message to pop up. So that people uh, can see this. Okay, so this, when you import a beam uh, or a uh, DICOM has information about the LINAC, the LINAC is something we need to define in MMCTP, which we're going to show you now. But since we, we don't know, uh, we have not defined any beams, uh, LINACs in uh, our, uh, uh, in MMCTP, this is what we're gonna get. You see, this is not configured on shell Raspberry Pi. And the definition needs to be done for each shell. So we're going to close this, okay? And we are going to go to back to the configuration. If you've opened the configuration prior to importing any patient, you will not find anything here. But uh, now after importing the, the patient, well, it is going to grab the Linux name from the DICOM file. Uh, probably this is also read from the DICOM file and the energy. Of course, 2.5, that's an imaging energy. We're gonna delete this energy. So I'm gonna delete this. Okay, we have a six because that's, uh, because remember in the DICOM file, DICOM RT, there were two energies, one for the imaging and one for the treatment. So both of them were actually uh, imported and uh, defined. But why we like to, I think, import the DICOM file is because of this next step. This information, I think, is going to be grabbed in automatically from the DICOM RT. Otherwise, we have to put the information here manually, especially this long matches of where the MLC is and, uh, and so on. So that's why uh, I think importing a patient saves you a lot of hassle. 
correct, Andrew? Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so the leaf, uh, leaf pairs, the binary, I think that's for... Uh, that's for Tomo. Uh, what, what I would do, Wameed, is the MLC name, I would uh, rename it to something a little bit more uh, user-friendly. Okay. Uh, because you'll have so, possibly many um, Linux that use that MLC. Okay. So we can, or we can put it Varian, just put Varian Millennium MLC. If you have a high definition, you can put a high definition. Right. So that's a typical name that I would use. And the other aspect you might want to include is the MLC source to Yes, this is zero. This is something we need to grab. Okay, where is that? So let's open. Uh, okay. So let's open. Uh, this is a typical uh, file. I'm reading this from the text file, but if you, you, you're going to do it from the beam, uh, uh, you should have you know the location of the MLC. So here, a dynamic MLC. Uh, this is, I think it's, uh, this is where it is, 48.175. Okay. And the reason it needs that so that it calculates openings, taking into consideration the divergence of the beam. Because uh, the DICOM file doesn't just have the MLC openings, I think at 100 SSD, not at where the MLCs are. But beam, when we want to set the opening of the MLCs, the input file, we need to specify the opening or the location of the MLC at the MLC level. So here. I forgot what the value is, what's one or two or. Uh, 48.175. Okay, anything else we need to do here, Andrew? That's, that's it for the MLC. Okay. Accessory? For the most part, I don't think there'll be too many people doing physical wedges or applicators or okay. dynamic wedges, but this is where you'd put the STT file path. Okay. So I need to grab the STT file and put it uh, under uh, the, this is McGill uh, MMCTP setting. Where is that folder? It's under. These are your, put... You can, uh, you, this, what this is actually doing is it's, it could be anywhere. This is a, you're clicking the path to that file. Okay. okay. So you can have it anywhere, but if you, you, by default, you could be in this MMCTP dash settings folder. Okay. So that because I don't have the file, but uh, if I mean uh, I don't have it now on the Windows machine, but right. so I'm going to leave this part. Yeah. Okay. And then the three, this is important now. The last step. This is important. So the input file we need to I think grab an, a a, a typical uh, or uh, a template. Let's say a template for the input the input file for the beam. So I need to grab one. Let me try to get it. Okay, because I need FTP. Can I copy? This. Okay. 
A lot of windows open. <laughs> so this is a problem. Okay. Let's try to use a text editor. And, uh, let's get a new file. And now I need to save it as uh, we it 2B, 6MV, and uh, just as the template, EGS template. I don't want the text file extension, but where did I save this? Save as. Okay. So I need to remove the, the, the extension because uh, I think it's text now. Bilal, do you know how to show the extensions and then remove them? Or does it matter, Andrew? Right, under properties uh, we need. Yeah, you can. I think I wanted to show it's a text file so that I yes. can remove the extension. Is it advanced? Um, advanced? Yes, advanced and show extensions. But that's in the configuration, right? Um, Just a second. It's in the for, uh, this properties for uh, you. Op do you have an options menu over to the right, Omid? Okay. Yeah. Hit that. View. And there it is. It should be somewhere. Show video files for the Okay, that's fine. Hide extensions for no files. This one. There you go. Yeah, yeah. that yes. should be. Okay. So I just want to remove this <coughs> Okay. So you'll want to move that into your your yes, beam. beam NRC folder. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And uh, let's see. So here this is where I need to select a template file and the text file I know for the uh, mine is called Linux. the text data file that I use uh, I just call it there then the next step is these shells so it seems that it still remember or uh, the sh about the shell but I'm not going to be worried about this the beam folder this is the folder where the beam is located under the EGS NRC remember we have set on the shell the folder for EGS NRC to be under slash home slash MMCTP slash EGS NRC. So we don't need to put the full path. All what we need to do is to put the path of uh, uh, the Linux. Okay. I'm going to put it also for the Ubuntu. It's the same path, but uh, I know that this one is not working because the shell has. And I think we're set now. Well, you could, well, Mead, if you knew what the dose XYZ NRC dose value is, you could enter it here at this so point. Please, please explain to us what, what is this value. So when you do a Monte Carlo calculation, the end results from dose XYZ are dose per incident history, I believe. Maybe the units are not quite exactly that. But what we want to do in a patient calculation is convert that number into dose per monitor units. So that when you scale by the monitor units of the beam, you have an absolute dose in centigrade or gray. So you'll need to run a calibration of your unit so that you can get 
your normalization point. And your normalization point is usually where you set one monitor unit equals one centigrade. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but how to do it? <laughs> so how to do it? So you would run a 10 by 10 field with no MLCs, just the JAWS, and you would create a phantom at your SSD, wherever your calibration point is. So it could be SSD of 100, and then you can use the dose at 10 centimeters depth or the dose at five centimeters depth, wherever you've defined your calibration point, or you might have your calibration point at D max. So you could use uh, the D max point, wherever your one centigrade per one monitor unit point is, you need to determine what that dose value is from dose X, Y, Z. And that dose value will be dose per incident history. I will tell you what I've done, Andrew. Pardon? And I will, I will tell you what I've done and I will show, because I struggled a little bit with this. Sure, okay. okay. I went to Eclipse and then I created a phantom and, uh, then, and then put the uh, field of uh, 100, uh, 100 SSD 10 by 10 and put 100 monitor units, okay? Although that, that's, so this is what I've done. I imported the, this uh, uh, DAC-MRT into MMCTP. The problem I faced is that because there is no image, somehow everything, uh, probably that's my Mac version. Maybe there is a problem with the Mac version. Okay, maybe with the windows it's going to be different. Everything is just uh, so the calculate uh, the MCTP assumed that everything is air. So whenever I run the calculation, of course, calculation error takes a long time and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I ended up doing. Uh, I had a, a scanned phantom, and uh, then I did exactly the same. Although that's solid water, it's not water, and that's how I got around this problem that I was facing. I was hoping, uh, because another problem, I could not generate a physics patient, because you could do it also from MCTP, I believe you can generate a physics patient, but I could not do that with the, with the Mac version. Okay, well, maybe next week I can go over uh, this exact process in a little bit more detail. Yeah, I think this is important. That I used. Okay, so we're set here. So we're, I'm gonna leave this one because I just want to make sure everything works, runs. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can close this now. Okay, and uh, now let's see. So this beam. I can't see the field, the plan information. This works beautifully on Windows. It doesn't work on my Mac. This is another thing I yeah. noticed. It looks like you need to slide. There's a slide bar to your right. Yes. That, uh, slide bar to the right. Keep going to the right all the way. That No, you passed it. Okay. MMCTP is within a window and you can't see the header. Oh, yeah, here, here. Okay, oh. I see it now. Okay. Now, if you were to maximize MMCTP, it'll it'll fit your screen and that slide bar should disappear. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, hit, this one. hit that one. Uh, yeah, hit that one. There you go. Okay. So, this is the plan, actually. Uh, Patient plan, and there it is. This is this is the distribution from Eclipse. Okay. okay. These are the fields. I can do. I don't want to have the imaging field, so I'm going to delete it. And I have this one is an imaging field. Delete. And then delete. So this is the beam property. Photon, two beam goes, that's the machine. And, well, me, uh, yes. I'm gonna interrupt. Whenever yeah. you delete a beam uh, as such, the system can have a hard time accommodating that change. 
because every all the calculations are based on the beam number. So it's important to save that change. So if the system were to crash, uh, things would be properly. So, save plan, so I hit your save plan. plan. Yeah. Okay. So that's gonna, now our beam order has been renumbered. So, okay. so it could cause problems if it were to be, if the system crashed before it saved that change. So this is the information about the beam, the dose rate. I think all of this information is grabbed from the DICOM RT. The number of monitor units uh, is used here, 208. If you look at the geometry, you will have the field, uh, you know, beam openings. Although I think this is uh, uh, a uh, what we call a dynamic uh, jaw. So the, the jaws would actually change size. So you can uh, actually, with me, before you move on, there's a you can look at each control point of the jaws. There's a yeah, sliding right? window there. Yeah, that, you that see the good. jaws moving. Okay. Yeah, because we are using uh, jaw tracking. Yeah, jaw tracking. Nice. nice. Okay. And then the accessories, that's the MLCs. Again, you can track, you can see the MLC openings. And uh, we have not I haven't done anything about electrons, but that's probably an advanced topic we can look at that uh, in the future. Okay, so uh, we're set here. The next step is we will hit on beam NRC and double click on the first beam. So let's, the first thing will be, uh, yeah, uh, the text, we need to configure well, action. I'll, I'll explain what's going on here. So what happened was we imported this patient as the first patient in the system. And then we started to define properties for this type of, of uh, machine. So it doesn't know the PEGS file because we defined the PEGS file after we imported this patient. So there's a way of updating this information or you can type it in manually. So it means just typing in the PEGS file. So how do you update it, show us. <laughs> Okay, so you can you can hit X on this window. Okay. Uh, go to File, Configurations, Dose XYZ Settings. Oh, but this sorry. is for the Phantom, right? Sorry, sorry. I meant uh, Beam NRC okay. settings. All right. Configuration Beam. No, no, no. Uh, this is the Beam models. Okay, There's a Beam is... NRC settings option. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Well, it's not here. Okay. There is a setting to reinitialize the defaults for each uh, model. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to op open up a quick patient on my calculator. Just a quick, uh, since this is open now. Uh, any recommendations for uh, number of jaws for each beam? Because eight is the default. I have a 64 core. Should I put 64? So it's yeah, I think 64 yeah. is okay. Yeah, so so for this part, you, you put the number of cores. It's not like the, the number of maximum calculations uh, for the shell uh, configuration. Here basically is saying when you, ex when you do the calculation, it's automatically split the calculation uh, to 68 uh, jobs. Okay, anything else we need to modify here? Do you usually remove the W files or the mod shell or do you keep them? I, it's, uh, I have, I use, uh, it, de it depends on the cluster, but I usually like to re remove them. Sometimes they're not removed automatically. Usually I use libraries just for information. I use being, uh, Linux uh, libraries, but uh, anyway. Okay, so do you want to share something from your side? I am still trying to find where I can reinitialize the, the defaults for a calculation. 
and maybe they've been removed. There used to be an option to reinitialize defaults. I can't find it, so we'll just proceed as normal. So I'm going to just put the pigs file. This is the Linux pigs file. Yeah. And the next time you add this beam, that pegs file will be populated by default. I, if you hit advanced beam NRC options right now, this is actually, it's right here. Reload defaults down at the bottom. Reload default is going to reinitialize this, this calculation. And you saw there was nothing populated before because it didn't know which, which beam NRC file to look for. So now yes. it has a name and it, and it can read the information properly. I really liked it because when I reloaded this, I got the three component modules for the DNA, uh, the source, because it, it took the template file and read everything from the template file and populated this. I think even the physics part, uh, this is also read from the uh, template file. So if uh, in my template file, for example, I like to use, okay, set, you know, Compound, Compton, although it's not really relevant. That's a really scattering. We know it's not relevant for, an, uh, for high energy. But uh, if you're interested to actually make those calculation options, uh, physics options default, then make sure you put them in the template. Then uh, every time you, you do the calculation, it will automatically use those uh, uh, values. You can modify them. And I believe once you modify, if you want to save, you can save this as a default, right? It will save it back. Sorry, I was muted, Mumid. Yes, if if you need to make tweaks to your template file, you can save back those defaults for the next okay. calculation. Okay. 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 So let's. So this is finished. Uh, well, I just thought we can test that it runs. So I'm going to hit run. It's going to. Start Run 15,000 uh, histories, and we should start to see here. Uh... Well, Mead, if you move this window a little bit higher, okay. this beam NRC window, you can see that it's giving you a warning. Okay. Online so Linux shell. So let's see if the uh, shells. So it thinks probably thinks this is is offline. Okay. Uh, what I would do is is make sure that the other shell you've put as offline. So you think you have two shells to find? Turn that one to offline. So it's not trying to use that one. I'm gonna delete it. That's gonna hit. Uh, Okay, so this is okay. So now these are okay. Let's try again. Right, so it's not functioning properly here. So I would go, I would close that window and go to your shell window, which is fine. Close the patient. Oh, no, you need to close the patient. Let's go to the shell. And go to shell run. Can I try this? Uh, no, uh, hit shell run, and I'm curious what it's doing. So I think it was trying, it's getting stuck on the FTP. Uh, if, you, if you hit this connection test for FTP and then go back to shell run. Okay, it worked. That worked fine. Yeah. The file was transferred. Okay, we're gonna close. Because I think it might not update. Our, that's why I, w I wanted to close and open again okay. so it will. I'll, I'll try that. Patient. Yeah, so let's save. And uh, this open
Okay. So if there is something not correct in our beam definition. Then. Yes, we have to, because we changed the name of the, the beam. MLCs. MLC. Yeah. Uh, that, that name was associated to those two fields. We'll have to change the field model for each of those back to the name that we called the MLC. So, so, so remember guys, we imported the DICOM first, okay, and then MMCTP used default names for, ML, for MLCs and so on and so on. We went and changed those. And now when we're trying to use the patient to calculate, it's looking for those initial names for MLCs, could not find them. That's why I think the yeah. problem is. So this is changed from, from here, Andrew, or? Yeah, you can, so double click each, and go back to external beam, yeah. double click on each of these, these, and then go to the MLC itself. Yes, here, I see it now, okay. okay. So what, what's happened though, Wameed, is we've actually lost the MLC. So uh, you're, what, you, what you'll need to do is re-import the plan file. Okay. We'll do that. You can do that from here, this window right here. If you hit file. Do I need to delete a uh, uh, patient from the folder or? No, okay. no. And import DICOM RT plan. Structures are there, so I don't need. And then scroll to the actual plan for this patient. But how do I know the plan? So it's, it'll, it'll be labeled RP. So these are all the CTs. Yeah, but I have several patients here. That's just, okay, that's a problem. Yeah, so I think I'm going to delete the patient. Okay. I'll just do it again. Okay, so here is McGill RP. This is the patient. Now we're going to import again. I like that while we're doing this, we're facing problems and we're solving them because then this is typically what people might face and uh, then uh, yeah. this would be a good reference. Okay, you need to do this, how we solve this and so on. The other, one of the other concerns I have for potentially why the calculation didn't run would be how we change the patient's name. And we can go into a little bit more depth into changing the name for this patient as well just to make sure everything. I will leave everything now, just so that we, we make sure that the calculation runs. Sure. I've run into a number of issues with uh, folder names being too long because the command to transfer the files from one system to another has a character limit to the, the absolute path. That One is thing, I mean, while this is actually important, uh, when you have, when, for example, for a given CT, you have multiple plans. Uh, I found that MMCTP cannot, uh, does not know which plan below, uh, which those uh, matrix belongs to which plan. So usually for each plan, it will list for those distributions. So suppose I imported a patient with four plans for those distributions. At least the, I'm, I'm, this is my experience on the Mac side. Uh, then when I import the patient, it will import the plans, but then it, for each plan, it will attach to it the four those distributions. I have to manually go and see which distribution makes sense and belongs to that plan, and, and then I delete the other three. Oh, okay. Is that a mad problem or that is something? No, that, that's how, that's just this, the, the method in which the okay. doses are 
linking to plans? It is actually for in this patient because yeah. I have multiple plans uh, here and uh, multiple distributions. Okay. Any questions, guys, while this is uh, creating the CT images? Bilal Hussain, how is it working with, with your Linux? Uh, because uh, he installed it on Linux. It is connected, actually, but I could not load any patient files till now. I not tried that. OK. It's connected, very much connected. Shell is working. Yeah, we have some question in the chat list. Uh, someone is asking, can the MMCTB work independently without the AGS and RC? It can work for viewing dose distributions and calculating DVHs, subtracting and adding doses together, but that's that's about all it, it will do. Um, it doesn't do any of the calculations on its own in terms of creating new Monte Carlo calculated dose distributions. Okay. And does it work with the brachytherapy? No, it's currently not uh, been coded to work with any brachytherapy calculation engine within EGS NRC. Mm -hmm. However, uh, if you had a brachytherapy DICOM RT plan, you would be able to import the dose and, and the structures and, and CT images or MR images I'm not too confident that ultrasound would work. I, I don't think the ultrasound images would uh, import properly. Andrew, I have a question. <clears throat> I have it to a cobalt machine, okay? Uh, where Bill, probably we have a source, we have, uh, we have two sets of jaws and so on. Is it easy to use MMCTP with that machine since it's not listed actually on, uh, on uh, the list of machines or not? Are you asking about adding another machine, how easy it is to do that? Well, that I have, yeah, because you have a specific, for example, for Varian, probably the component model is going to be the JAWS, okay, uh, Whatever, because I'm, I'm wondering, we have a, a machine, a Linux. Uh, it's not a Linux, it's a Cobalt machine, okay? And the, dy the dynamic, uh, let's say, component modules are the jaw. Uh, we have two sets of jaws. So we have jaws and trimmers. And the question is, uh, uh, is that how easy can we use that, uh, that machine with MMCTP? So if the jaws function very similar to how the Varian jaws function, yeah. then you can use the same method. So the, yeah, I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm asking you because we can, for example, use one component. There are uh, two pairs of jaws, standard jaws, and then there are trimmers, which we are we are defining as jaws also. Okay, okay. so a total of four jaws are there. A Varian machine has two pairs of jaws. So we could, for example, define two component modules uh, for the beam with two sets of jaws, or we can define one component module of uh, four pairs of jaws. The question I have is MMCTP, uh, if there are two component modules of jaws, will it calculate the divergences correctly for both component modules or uh, or should no. we just try it and give you a feedback about that? Well, it, it, uh, it will calculate it properly if you're treating it very similar to the JAWS on a variant LINAC in the sense that the calculate, you, can, you can apply the same calculations to determine divergence on any set of JAWS. Assuming so if, if we have two component modules of JAWS, Defined on the beam. MMCTP can handle that? 
Uh, it wouldn't be able to handle it without some modifications. Yeah, I thought so. You'd need to have some identifiers okay. that tell the system this is this is the upper jaw, this is the lower jaw, because we can. I, what I would say is, if we want to look at how the jaws are determined, we can spend some time next week to go over that calculation and what flags MMCTP uses within the template input file to determine that these are X jaws or these are Y jaws. But if you, if you just have some X and Y jaws in your cobalt machine, then it's very simple to, to apply that same method to determine the divergence. But let me tell you again, what's the, what's the issue? We have, a, let's say at 30 centimeter or something, we have two pairs of jaws. These are X and Y jaws. Yeah. And then, at a different level, we have another two pairs of jaws or trimmers, which we are calling, we're defining them as jaws. Right. Currently, we have set two component models for jaws, one here to define this pair. Actually, uh, the way I'm, I've seen it, there are four component models, one to define this set of jaw, one pair, and another one to define this one. Although I believe we can combine them in one component module and then there are other, uh, this component module to define the set down here. My question to you is uh, for MMCTP to work, okay, without modification. Suppose I combine all of these four jaws into one component module, because I can do that with MMC, with uh, Beam. Yeah. Will it work without modification or? I don't think it will. Because I th it's it's going it's going to need some numbers to determine offsets for the different jaws, and I I'm going to open up the source code right now. I think it's it's either going to assume it's an X jaw or a Y jaw, and now if you combine both of the X and the Y jaw into one CM, it's going to be a problem. That might be a problem. Okay, okay, how about if we have two CMs? That would be an easier approach. Okay. And then you would just have a, a slightly different divergence based on the height of yes. the CMs. Yeah. Almost there. It takes a long time to create the images uh, from the uh, CT. That's really when, uh, when my machine is probably not powerful enough. Uh, you have a cluster at work uh, that you do the calculation. I mean, how big is that cluster? And uh, typically, well, it's, a very, it's a very modest one. I, I think there's 30 um, cores. 30 cores. Yes. I'm just looking at the code, Wamid, and actually, within the dynamic JAWS CM, I have it so that it's reading in both the X and the Y field. So you can have two dynamic jaw CMs to define your different divergences for X and Y direction. So I will try it. I will, uh, I will uh, put it, uh, okay, so now this is done. Let me close. And now we need to open the patient.
because I think uh, what we want. Okay, let me see if I found what we have. But let me see if I can put the image fine. So if you if you if we meet right there before you hit close, if you type the MLC name for this Linac up up at the top, keep going. Yeah, no, no, uh, right, keep going. MLC name for this Linac is the first uh, higher, higher, okay. there. Okay. okay, that's it. So now it's going to associate that MLC, which is defined below for this okay. Linac. And I think we lost that connection okay. in the last import of this patient. So, okay, so if we we'll try, we'll try it now. I, what I would do is I would close the patient now, don't save anything, open it up again, and you shouldn't see that MLC error message. Have you managed to calculate SSDs or still uh, it's a difficult task? Oh no, I'm not, I'm not updating SSDs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so now the uh, error message is not there. Okay, so we should be able to go to Beam. And uh, which field is the second one? Should I delete the fields now, the imaging fields? I would delete before? the imaging fields. Before I do a calculation. Yeah. And then I would save the plan. Or actually, bef before you save, sorry, just go into the each field. Make sure the MLC is properly defined and visually displayed to ensure that nothing was lost. Okay, so we have the information. So that's good. Now you Let's can save. save it. So now, it Text file automatically is there. No problems. So that's done. Okay, I see something. So now save to disk. Yes. Okay, that's. Uh, I think I know that what the problem is. That's something related to the to the beam calculation because I need to get the phase space file. Oh, no, actually the phase space file is there. So input file does not exist. So what I, what I would do here is uh, open up the shell run and see if the file was transferred properly. Another option is to open up a terminal and make sure that the file was FTP'd over. So I don't see an FTP. So uh, it um, it looks like it didn't FTP the file. And, uh, 
Windows can use a, a secure copy. I checked, I, I think it's fine. Because I don't have an FTP server. I have a... A secure copy is what it's actually using. Um, uh, FTP is just a casual language. Yeah. But it, it is using secure copy. So let's try it. 198, 192, 11. Okay. Go to the beam directory we'll need. Oh yeah, it's a beam. It's not a those sorry. Something funny with this character. I don't yes. know why. That. Okay. C D E D S. And one thing you can look at is see if it's if it dropped it in your home location first. There might be there might be a transfer right there. So you can see this is where MMCTP puts the test file okay. on your home location. So the system itself can transfer files. Now we're just trying to verify why the input file wasn't transferred properly. Right, so I don't see it there. Let me clear this. The one concern I have is that uh, for some reason that the, there's a space in the path file name. So the next step I would look at would be to go to your McGill RT folder through your file explorer. Yeah, nothing got transferred. Yeah. Let's run it one more time. Okay, the same issue. Okay, so where do I need to go next? Go to your McGill RT folder McGill on your RT. file explorer and let's let's look at the absolute path to this input file. Okay, this is the uh, the the McGill explorer uh, the McGill uh, path. Okay. So that is under C, and uh, program files. Oh, no. Uh, no, no, go back. Go back to your McGill RT folder, which is okay. right there. Okay. Yeah, double click the McGill RT one. Yeah. Oh. McGill RT. Yes. Okay. And then go into this guy, this folder, and to that CT into the plan. And you can see this is the file right here. If you right click on the EGS. This is it, right? Yeah, if you right click yeah. on that one and go to properties, we should see the absolute path. If we can increase that. And uh, change. Uh, I don't think we can, I don't think we're gonna be able to see it. Oh, here, uh, location. Just, no, just to click on the uh, edge of the uh, window, you can see the whole path. Here? Yeah. Uh, the edge of the window itself, you, you can maximize it. Okay, I see. I see what Bilal is saying. He's saying this is the full path here, right? Yes. Well, what I'm concerned about here, Ramit, is there's too many characters in the full path. Uh, if you hover over it, it, just hover over the location. Sorry, go back. Go back to properties and hover over that location below. And it pops up the full path, oh, just like how, how it was. So, so this is my concern that there's too many characters in in that path. And so one of the ways of, of avoiding this situation would be to move your McGill RT folder A to, the, up. to the C drive. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's to make sure that your patient names 
don't contain as many characters. I'll try to do this now very quickly. Okay, we need to close it. Okay. Do I need now to change the set, your set your preferences again, right? Yes. So we need to go just to admin and here. So let's change this. Can I to allow, allow me to modify it directly, I guess? Oh, I need to, okay. So it's here, we go to C, and that's we can add to. And uh, this one, go to C. So we'll work on renaming that patient as well. When, when you go file, open that patient. Now I see it. Yeah. It, uh, we, can, we can work on those folder names. You could do this manually. It, it, it might be faster to do it manually. But I'll show you how the there's um, I'll show I'll show you that the folder names are linked to the patient names, which is not necessarily the best practice. I just want to make sure first before renaming that uh, at, maybe that the issue is going to be resolved now. Oh, that's true. It, we we have reduced the characters by quite yeah. a bit already. Yeah, so let's try this. Yes, now it's FTP uploading, so it should work. Okay, so we, we solved, we didn't have to solve the second problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So at least now, <laughs> I think the configuration is, uh, minimum configuration is working properly. Let's call it that. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So while we're here, the yeah. it's important to know what the number of test histories does, and uh, I think the number of histories over on the left and the desired particle density, how those three variables are linked. So what Wamid has done by running this calculation is he's run that fifteen thousand histories as a test run. And this serves two purposes. One, it shows that the execution can run completely. And it also gives an estimate for the, for the statistics of the calculation. So if you, if you, if you have a desired particle density of 500,000, you're going to need basically 950 million histories. And that's what this little test run. And you can change things, by the way, just for everyone. Because everything is linked to the time also. So let me just show you. So this is the desire. So basically, uh, now the, the default number of uh, splitting jobs on, on Raspberry now is eight. So when I, if I'm going to submit this, it's going to submit to eight jobs. And to complete this number of histories, 950 million, is going to require four hours. I know, for example, I can do 60, 80. So if I change the number of jobs, now this is roughly going to finish it in uh, 30 minutes, simulating the 95 million uh, uh, particles. That's why the more cores you have, it's, uh, okay. but if, for example, you cannot afford to, to you know, time-wise, you can 
once you have done the calculation and uh, at least this uh, the script runs no errors then you can manually come and change either the density you want or you can just manually put look i want one million i would be happy with one million but then the number of density the particle because probably you're going to use this for a dose calculation and uh, that might not provide you with very good uh, particle density. And this is, by the way, an open, uh, no, this is actually, a, well, it's a VMAT, it's not open field. So the way I do this is, this is my personal, uh, uh, I, I don't actually go through calculation of phase space files. And the dose calculation, this probably we can cover next week, but then instead of using the phase space file as a source, uh, I, I use actually a Linux model as the source. There are advantages and disadvantages uh, to that for sure. Okay, I think we're now close to two hours. So we're gonna wrap things up. I think uh, Andrew, with his help, uh, now I have a running uh, MMCTP on uh, Windows, uh, on Windows machine. Uh, things are looking fine uh, so far. Uh, we managed to do a beam model. We, we made our, uh, or set our beam model to run a beam simulation. Uh, next time, probably we're going to look into the, uh, the dose calculation part. Uh, that's probably easy, but we need to spend some time with Andrew on the CT uh, conversion, CT numbers, and so on. Yeah, so I can I can go over uh, next week how yeah. how to do the next steps to configure yes. calculation. Yeah. That'd be great, I think. And then we'll between that this session and the and the next one, we'll go A to Z from install to a final calculation. Yes, but I will try to also prepare is uh, because we need to set the, the MU uh, to history conversion. So I will uh, try to explore this with, uh, with, uh, with uh, NMCTP on Windows. I know it did not work well with the Mac version. And I will let you know if I faced any problems, if, it's, if this is a straightforward task and so on. And then we can demonstrate this. Probably I can show the results, or if you have done it, Andrew, you can show this result. But I think for everyone, they need to understand this concept very well. I agree, yes. It's a yeah. crucial step. Yes, yes. Okay, so now we're close to two hours. Any other questions, final questions? Was this useful? Yeah, everybody is satisfied. And we have one question. Can we have a restart option in the MMCTV? So the restart option, I would uh, question restarting what? Are we restarting a calculation? One option you have is a close connection option. And what that does is if you've launched a simulation and it is hung, on DOS XYZ side or Beam NRC side, there's an option to close the connection between the two programs. And that will force um, a, ter a termination point, And then you can resubmit the simulation after that. I don't know if that answers the question though. Um, they are asking actually about to, to add more particle history. So instead of... Um... Well, system, yeah. If, yeah, if you go to advanced beam settings, which Wamid is just doing, and if you and go to here. run option, there is that restart. Oh, restart. Okay, it's there. Okay. So we will explore all of these, I think, more in details. Uh, and if you have questions, please bring them up. Because uh, now we have Andrew with us. He can help us. Uh, and we're recording this, you know, for, for a lot of people might be struggling with the, with some of these concepts and, and uh, so, so having these recorded might help issues for, for many other people too. So bring all the problems you have and uh, hopefully we can solve them one by one. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for uh, your time. And thank you all for uh, attending uh, this session. Yes.
Thanks for the questions and the yeah. feedback. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you feedback, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so the fa for feedback, I think you need to put the link for the P-Link on the Git uh, on the page. That's useful. And the GitHub, people. yes. Yes, that would be useful how people can download that stuff. Yeah. And by the way, once the video, once this is on YouTube, you can also, uh, if you want, you can link it in GitHub so people can actually watch this. Uh, and That's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So thank okay. you very much and good night uh, to all of the world. Good afternoon, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. See you then. Thank you very much.